to learn something from the Word of God. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 33. And when you're there, would we all stand in honor of the Word of God? Matthew chapter 6, verse number 33. We're going to read this. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 through 46. Before we begin reading, I'd like to... Uh, uh, I forgot during the announcements I was going to make it. Uh, but I'll make it now. Uh, since uh, now is the new pastor, the membership at the church was closed for a, a period of time while the church waited for a new pastor to come. Uh, now that uh, I'm here, uh, I'd like to, on, on this Sunday morning, make the uh, official announcement that the church membership is open. And so if you're here this morning, you'd like to join the church, we'd like to invite you at the end of the service to come forward. I'll have you fill out a decision card and uh, put down there your information and just as a uh, formal request and um, uh, what church you're coming from. After in the invitation, I'm going to explain a little bit why we do it that way, uh, exactly the reasoning for that, but we do that to make it official. So if you're here today and you're not an official member and you would like to join Amazing Grace Baptist Church, I'm excited and I would like you to come uh, at the invitation, fill out a, a, a decision card and make that a, a, an official uh, declaration, amen. So we're excited for that to open the membership. And if you know anybody that wants to be a member, tell them, come on, let's go, amen. And uh, No, I'm kidding, but we'd like to invite you to, to come and, uh, and if, invite you to be a member. Of course, now, we, and like I said, just I'll explain more of it after, but to be a member, of course, of the church, you have to be saved, born again, know that you're born again. I know and I believe everybody here is, but you also have had to have been baptized either in this church or a church of like faith. And, and I'll go over that some more at the invitation. So if you meet under those qualifications and you are welcome to join and be a member, uh, if not, meet me after church or in my office later and we can talk about it, explain uh, exactly what or why. But I'd like to uh, uh, put that out there to invite you. Amen. So Matthew chapter 6, verse number 33. The Bible says we're going to start here. Or I'm sorry, I'm in Matthew. I meant Mark. I apologize. I'm going to need glasses soon. This is terrible. Mark chapter 6, verse number 33. Amen. I apologize. One book over, Mark chapter 6, verse number 33. Although Matthew 6, 33 is a good verse, put it to memory. Amen. Mark 6, 33, the Bible says, And the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither out of all cities, and out went them, and came together unto him, and Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep, not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, This is a desert place, and now the time is far past. Send them away that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. He answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, Shall we go and buy two hundred penny worth of bread, and give them to eat? He saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? Go and see. And when they knew, they say, Five and two fishes. And he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven, and blessed, and break the loaves, and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fishes divided he among them all. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up twelve baskets full of the fragments and of the fishes. And they that did eat of the loaves were about five thousand men. Amen. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, we sure do love you. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be in the house of God. Thank you, Father, that I get a chance to preach God's Word. Ask Holy Spirit that you please would use me this morning. Holy Spirit, I yield myself to you. Ask that you would please help me to say only what you'd want to be said. Lord, you know the time put in. Lord, the studying. Lord, the... Lord, in my heart, Lord, to just want to be a help and be a blessing. I pray that, Holy Spirit of God, we will all learn a truth this morning that I learned as well, and that, Lord, you would speak to our hearts, that, Holy Spirit, we would be better Christians because of it. Again, if anybody here, Lord, doesn't know that if they died, that they'd be with you in heaven today, if they don't know 100% sure that they are born again, may, Holy Spirit, you do a work today in their life, and that they would, uh, Lord, that you would convict their heart to help them understand their need for a Savior, and that they would come forward at the invitation time, come forward at the end of the service, allow me a chance to show them from God's Word how that they, they can be 100% sure that if they died, they'd go to heaven. Lord, if everybody here, Lord, is born again, then, Lord, may you speak to every heart. Lord, would you speak to the Christians, Lord, and speak to us, give us what we need, 
Give us what you know, Lord, that we need to make it through, Lord, the week. And, Lord, and be better Christians because of it. We love you. We thank you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to pull from this uh, portion of Scripture, Mark chapter 6, this story here of the uh, feeding the 5,000. Very, uh, very common uh, portion of Scripture. If you've been in church uh, for any length of time, you're familiar with how that Jesus uh, fed the hungry with, and, and multiplied the, the bread and two fishes. Just not long before this, though, when you, if you skip back in, in Mark chapter 6, John the Baptist has just been beheaded. He's been killed by Herod. Jesus uh, wanted the disciples to rest. If you look there in uh, verse number 30, it says, And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. They had just, what they had just done in this portion of Scripture is they had just buried John the Baptist. He's just been beheaded, just been killed by Herod as a token. Uh, Herod did this as a token uh, to a, a damsel that when she came and danced before him, she pleased him and he made a commitment he would give even to the half of the kingdom and she requested for the head of John the Baptist. Amen. Whenever you serve God, you're going to be hated. Amen. John the Baptist was hated by those that were anti-God. And they, as a result, he was beheaded. Amen. Whenever you serve God, whenever you give your life to serve the Lord, amen, you're going to be hated. Amen. But I'd be willing to give my life and give my head, amen, for the Lord Jesus Christ, like John the Baptist. Uh, but he was beheaded, and so the disciples had just buried him. So they've kind of come into a, a time here where it's a, little bit of, it's, it's a little bit sad for them. They've just lost a dear friend. They've just lost a, uh, the man that pointed them to Jesus. John the Baptist was, uh, as we know, he was the, uh, the one that made the way for, for Jesus. He paved the way uh, in, in, in preaching in the wilderness uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they lost a dear friend. And so they're very, uh, a little bit of grief has set in. So you look, verse 31, and he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. Jesus wanted them to rest. He knew that they had just come through a little bit of a tragic time. He said, For there were many coming and going, in verse 31, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. They didn't even have time to eat. There was so much going on and so much that they were, they were doing that they didn't have a time to even eat. And Jesus knows that they needed time. They needed a little bit of leisure. In a Christian's life there are going to be times when you need to rest. There are going to be times where you need to just take time even to eat. <laughs> Amen. You can't just serve God so much that you don't have time for your family. Amen. That doesn't mean that you stop doing what you're doing for God. It means that you take time aside and allow yourself to rest. So they departed into this desert place. Jesus wanted to give them a chance to rest. And they did, verse 32, and they departed into a desert place by ship privately. But wherever Jesus went, it just seemed to draw a crowd. Amen. Jesus was just very popular, well-known, also because not only uh, for what he did, but who he was. Uh, he had healed many people, had, uh, had fed the five, uh, or he, had, he was going to feed the 5,000, but he had just raised Jairus' daughter from the dead and all that he did. So Jesus was very popular, so he couldn't really go anywhere privately for very long, but he got the disciples away a chance to rest. But after a little bit of a rest time, they got a chance to eat, and Jesus gave them what they needed. He, it, it says here, and the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot. They all went after Jesus. Amen. Wherever Jesus is, it draws a crowd. Amen. That's why at the Amazing Grace Baptist Church, it's important that we lift up the name of Christ, because Jesus will draw a crowd. And Jesus will draw the right crowd. Amen. We're not going to lift up rock music around here. We're not going to lift up a, a entertainment philosophy because, yes, that will draw a crowd, but it won't draw the right crowd. When you lift up the name of Christ, who you, who you attract are those that are hungry to hear about Jesus, those that are hungry for the gospel, those that are hungry to serve God. Amen. It's important that we constantly lift up Jesus. Amen. Jesus will draw a crowd. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men. Amen. May, we, may at the Amazing Grace Baptist Church, may we always lift up Jesus, amen, at our church. And that will draw a crowd, amen. But Jesus couldn't get away. So the people come after him. They wanted to follow him. They wanted to see him do more miracles. More wanted to be healed. More wanted to have Jesus teach them. So when Jesus came out in verse 34, it says that he saw much people and he was moved with compassion toward them. 
Aren't you thankful that you serve a God that loves you? Amen. Jesus was moved with compassion. He saw the people. He saw the multitude that, want, that were hungry to hear from Him. And He had compassion. Amen. When you're hungry to hear from God, God doesn't turn a deaf ear. Amen. When you're hungry to get to know Jesus more, Jesus has compassion. Jesus will come to you. Jesus will get to know you. When you come to Jesus for forgiveness, amen, He's moved with compassion. Well, I'm thankful I serve a God that is moved with compassion. Amen. So many religions now, they, uh, you go out and they serve, you know, whether it's a, uh, whether Jehovah's Witness, Muslim, uh, whether it's uh, Hindus, it uh, doesn't matter what religion, they all serve out of fear. But I serve Him because He first loved me. Amen. Jesus was moved with compassion. Why? Because they were as a sheep not having a shepherd. Jesus saw them and they were sheep. He saw them as, his, as sheep that just needed to be led. Amen. People are sheep. God compares us to the sheep. And we have to have a shepherd. We have to be led. Amen. May, the, may Wichita know that there is a church that follows Jesus and that they can be led to be closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus wanted. He wanted to lead them as their shepherd closer to Him. Our job is to follow the shepherd. Me, uh, as a pastor, as an under-shepherd for the Lord, I am constantly trying to lead people, but I lead us to the great shepherd. I lead us to Jesus Christ. Why? Because I want us to get to know Jesus today. Amen. So Jesus had compassion on them. This is something that we can take into consideration in our own lives. When we see people, may we be moved with compassion. This moving with compassion should compel us to give them the gospel. It compelled Jesus to, to teach them many things. Amen. May we have that compassion for people. But then it says in verse 35, He began to teach them, and when the day was now far spent, it was getting close to evening, getting close for, to time to go home. The day's been far spent. His disciples came unto Him and said, This is a desert place, and the time is far past. Send them away that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. The disciples recognized what time it was, and Jesus was a good Baptist preacher, amen. He wasn't looking at the time, amen. He was just teaching, amen. He was preaching, amen. And the disciples said, hey, uh, uh, you know what time it is, right? He said, we're in a desert place. There's no food. There's no water. He said, what, what are we going to do? These people need to go. He told them, send them away. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think I would have enough courage to walk up to Jesus and say, you need to stop preaching and send these people home so they can eat. I don't know why, you know, I, maybe they just, I don't know. I don't think I'd have enough courage, amen. To, I, just like my dad, you know, when he normally would, uh, he normally preaches and ends right at 12 o'clock. Well, there's a couple of times where he would go over, amen. It would kind of be like, I never had the courage to stand up and say, uh, Pastor, 12 o'clock, you know, we got to go eat, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and don't you try it, <laughs> you know, but uh, I don't know, I, they had the courage to get to, to come to Jesus and tell, them, tell him that uh, it's time to, you know, time to stop and uh, time to send these people to go eat, but they had a concern, they recognized that the people needed to, to leave, uh, but they did not recognize who they were talking to for some reason, amen, verse 37, he answered and sent it to them, Give ye them to eat. Now this boggles my mind. They understand that they need the, the disciples understood that they needed to eat. And then Jesus, not you know, they, they don't know they don't have anything apparently. They don't have enough because he says you need to send them away so they can go by, so they can get something to eat. Then Jesus just looks at them and says, Well, give them something to eat. <laughs> you may see the disciples. <laughs> What? Jesus just says, well, give them something to eat. They're like, we don't have anything. We just, you know, they just got done telling him that they, he, they needed, he needed to send them away so they could buy themselves bread. Because they didn't have anything to eat. They didn't have anything to eat. They didn't even have time to eat. We just saw they, they were busy so much they didn't even have time to sit back and rest. And then Jesus says, well, give them something to eat. Amen. Jesus uh, knew what he, what, he, what he had in mind, but the disciples had no idea. You imagine the confusion that they had. Why would Jesus tell them to give, them, give something to eat when the, he knew very well they had nothing? Boy, isn't that true in the Christian life? God gives us a command. 
God leads us down a road where we, maybe sometimes we don't always understand why God is telling us to do that. We don't have the means to get it done. But it's because God knows that He has a plan. Amen. They're going to come, there's going to come a point in your life as a Christian where God from His Word is going to show you what He wants you to do and you're not going to understand how it can be done. It's going to be impossible. It's going to be beyond your power to get it done. But you're going to have to do it because God commanded you. The question this morning, and this would be the title, how is your focus? How's your focus this morning? You see, I believe the disciples were confused, but it's because they were looking at the situation from the wrong point of view. When you look at a situation based on a man's perspective, it's impossible. When you look at a situation based on what you can do, then it can never be done. But if we turn our focus onto Jesus, but if we turn our focus onto the one that gives us the command, then all things become possible. When you in your life get to a point to where God backs you into a corner and you don't know how you're going to be able to tithe, you don't know how you're going to be able to make it through the week, you don't know where the food will come from, but you just remember that God will provide. The Lord will lead you and the Lord will tell you what He wants done. You will not know how you'll be able to make it. But then you put your faith and trust in an almighty God and God will see you through. The same faith that you placed in Him for salvation is the same faith you have to put in Him day by day to lead you. The disciples, though, are like most Christians. Look there in verse 37. When they were given the command by Jesus, they said, Shall we go and buy 200 penny worth of bread and give them to eat? This was, not, uh, this was a uh, sarcastic question. If you can understand what the conversation, they're not being serious. They're like, what are we supposed to do? But they were being serious in one sense. They were trying to find out, they were trying to find the solution. Most Christians, when God gives a command or when God from His Word shows how, they, how He wants us to live, we begin to try to find our own solution to the problem. Well, what are we supposed to do, God? I can't go do this. You want me to take all the money that I have from my savings and give it to you, God? You want me just to give up everything that I've ever worked for, God? Most Christians try to find their own solution to the problem. But God is not looking for solutions. God is looking for obedience. In a Christian's life, when God gives you a command, when God tells you what He wants done, when God, through His Word, shows you how He wants you to live, God doesn't want you to try to find a solution. God wants you just to obey. God doesn't need you to figure it out. He already has. God just needs you to obey. When God told them, give ye them to eat, they did not see how it was supposed to be done. They did not understand how 5,000 men, and we know it's just men. Some, some try to say there was women and children with them. We don't know how many total. But when they were looking at the crowd, they thought, what, am I supposed, what are we supposed to do? Jesus already had a plan, though. But I believe their focus was wrong. They didn't realize who they were talking to. Most Christians would not have the problems they have would not have difficulty serving the Lord if they would figure out that it's Jesus that gives the command. Jesus is God, amen. Sometimes we forget who we serve. Even as a pastor, sometimes uh, I, I look, and I've only been a pastor for a week, but you know, you look at your situation, you look at what's going on, and you go, I don't know where in the world that's going to come from. But I have to remember that Jesus is the one that told us to go. Jesus is the one that established the church. Jesus is the one that gave us the command. Amen. If we will follow Jesus and recognize that Jesus is the one that told us to go, everything will be fine. 
Amen. Jesus is the only begotten Son of the Father, the bread of life, the I Am, the Alpha, the Omega. He controls the universe. But I like this, a, a good thought. When Jesus told them, give you them to eat, they were looking at what they could do. But they didn't realize that Jesus was giving them a blank check. That's how I look at it. When Jesus walked up and said, now go give them something to eat. This is the God of the universe. This is the Creator. This is the one who spoke and the worlds came into existence. He just gave them a blank check. Boy, they could have had fried chicken. They could have had steak. I mean, they could have had whatever. They, all they had to say was, all right, Jesus, well, what do you want us to, you know, can we have some steak, you know? I mean, all he had to do was speak and it would have been there. I mean, quail could have just come out of the wilderness like it did, you know? I mean, it could just been rained down manna. <laughs> Jesus just said, just give them something to eat. I mean, he gave them a blank check. In your life as a Christian, God has given you some commands to do something for him. And with those, he gives you promises. Those promises are blank checks. Those aren't, you, you shouldn't have to struggle wondering if God will keep his promise. You can know God will keep his promise. Now, you just trust God and just be excited to watch what God will do. When God promises that He'll provide for your needs, don't wonder how God's going to take care of it, because if you do that, you'll worry. Because I don't know how God will take care of it. I'm just excited to watch how God will take care of it. Amen? At our church, we have needs. We're Baptists. <laughs> we have needs. We have finances. I don't know how God's going to take care of it, but I know this, that Jesus said to go. And he promised that he'll provide for the needs of his church that has his heart that reaches people for Christ. And as long as we stay busy for God, God gives us a blank check. God will provide for our needs. Amen. We just have to get excited and understand that it's Jesus we're serving. Amen. You serve an almighty God. And in your life, maybe you don't understand where everything's going to come from. But when Jesus says give, just take advantage of it. Just be excited. Don't wonder and question. That's the natural thing to do. The disciples were only doing what comes naturally. It's natural to question God. Well, God, how am I supposed to give them something to eat? Where's it going to come from? I don't have the money. I don't have the means. You can't look at it from your point of view. You have to look at it from God's. Jesus knew what he wanted to do. Jesus had a plan already. You just have to be willing to trust God to do it. Amen. God in your life has given you some blank checks. God promised that wherever you go, that He would go with you. Amen. God has, He said, I have all power given unto me in heaven and in earth. We can reach the entire city of Wichita, Kansas. We can have our needs taken care of. We can have everything that God promises in His Word. We just have to be willing to trust Him for it. But don't just... They didn't, they didn't just have a problem with who they were talking to, but they, didn't, they, didn't, they forgot what Jesus had done. Look back there in chapter 5. When Jesus said, give ye them to eat, they questioned him because they, didn't real, they forgot what he's already done. Chapter 5, you begin reading in verse number 1 there, you'll see uh, that Jesus cast out devils. You keep going uh, in, in a little bit farther, and Jesus uh, he, uh, raises the daughter of Jairus from the dead. You keep going there, and he uh, heals a woman that had an issue of blood. And all she did was touch his garment, and she was healed. Amen? You remember what the, Jesus has done in your life, and that should encourage you to move on in the future. If the disciples would have just looked back and remembered what Jesus had already accomplished, what Jesus had already come through for people, it should have encouraged them to know that it could have been taken care of. In your life, what has God done for you? What has God brought you through? What has God taken care of? Are you saved this morning, born again? That's the greatest feat of all time. The fact that your sins are forgiven, that, you have a, that your name's written in heaven, the fact that He was willing to forgive you and give you a home in heaven is the greatest feat ever. That same faith that you had to trust Him for salvation is the same faith He asks for when difficulties come, 
When trials come as a church or trials come in your family or trials come in your home, you have to just take that same faith and say, God, I don't know where it's going to come from, but I'm going to trust you. I don't know if I have enough gas to make it to church, but we're going to get there. I don't know if I'm going to have food on the table, but we'll tithe. Amen. The Christian life is lived by faith. But you remember what God has already done in your life, and that will encourage you to move on in the future. The children of Israel had this problem. God said they forgot what He had done. They forgot the plagues. They forgot how God brought them out of Egypt. And when they got to Canaan land, they questioned, could God furnish a table in the wilderness? Can God? Can God? In our Christian's life, we get to where we forget what God has already done for us. And we still question God. You go back in your mind. You remember you have pillars where God has answered prayer, where God has taken care of you. And you mark those down and remember those and remind your children. Keep in remembrance constantly the answers to prayer that God gives. And the next time you come to a difficulty, it will help encourage you to live by faith. Because God is not limited by our circumstances. God is only limited by our faith. If you don't have the faith, then God can't. But if you have the faith, then God can. It doesn't matter what's going on around you that determines whether or not God can feed the 5,000. It doesn't matter or not where the food's going to come from. He just needed somebody to have faith. And in this story, it was a young lad with a lunch of, of the two fishes and five loaves. Amen. But... Here's the message. A couple things they needed to, I believe, that if they would have focused on, if they would have changed their focus, I believe that would have changed the story. Amen. In a Christian's life, our focus is wrong. We begin to have a wrong kind of a focus, and that leads us to questioning God. And I believe there's a couple things I'd like to give you that we can change our focus and, move, and do more for the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, focus on obedience, not the solution. Too many Christians are more worried, like the disciples, about solving the problem than they are about serving the Savior. Don't focus on the solution. How is it going to be done? You focus on obedience, and God will take care of it. When God asks you to tithe and give 10% to Him, don't focus on, well, how is God going to take care of me? If you focus on that, you're in trouble. Because you'll not know. You'll not see where it comes from. But you focus on just being obedient and trusting God, and the solution will come. You uh, focus on being faithful to church, and you watch your children turn out for God. Lots of times people have struggles with their families. And I've watched it over and over where they struggle because children maybe get away from the Lord and get weary. And they begin to think, well, church must not be working. You focus on your obedience and train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Don't focus on the solution. Focus on obedience. Don't try to solve the problem. Just serve the Savior. Amen. Because there are sometimes problems that God will put in your life that you can't solve. God will bring a difficulty that's impossible because He wants you to live by faith. The just shall live by faith. God will give you a command. Give you them to eat. You just focus on obeying and God will bring the result. At our church, we have to focus on obedience and God will take care of the needs. We have to all band together and focus on winning souls. Focus on being in church. Focus on reaching those that are lost. Focus on serving God and being right in our lives and tithing and giving all that we can. There's not one person that gives the most. Everybody in here gives the same. The biggest giver in our church is God. 
God will provide the needs. God just wants you to give your part. Give all that you had, whether it's the widow's two mites or whether it's uh, like Barnabas where you sell your land and give it all. God just wants you to give what you had and God will make up the rest. The disciples didn't have anything. And Jesus still provided because Jesus knows how he wants to get it done. You may not have anything. But Jesus will make up for nothing. Amen. But you give what you have. You tithe that $2. You tithe that $0.10. Cents. You tithe that $20. You may not make much. You may not have much. But you tithe. And you watch God take care of the rest. At our church, we all do our part. We serve God. We focus on obedience and just doing what God commands. And God promises us that He will provide the rest. God will make up the rest. I've seen it over and over where churches didn't know how they could make it. They begin to fall short. And they go out and just focus on winning souls. And focus on keeping the right mind and the right heart. And God's always come through. God can come through in our church. We just have to focus on obedience. You be obedient to God. You trust God. Do what God says. And it will turn out. Amen. God will take care of you. Amen. Don't be like the disciples and focus on how to solve the problem. Just serve. Amen. Number two, focus on what you have, not what you don't. Jesus, you see, they said, they told him, should we just go buy 200 penny worth of bread and give them to eat? Jesus said, you don't need 200 penny worth of bread. He said, how many loaves do you have? They didn't even know, they didn't even knew what they had. The disciples didn't even know what was there available. They were looking for more. Jesus said, what do you have? Then he had to tell them, go and see. Amen. In your life, focus and take care of what God has given to you, not what God hasn't. Well, God... I can't do this because I don't have that. God says, you can do everything I've given you to do with what I've given you right now. Amen. God had already provided. All he needed was the five loaves and two fishes. Jesus said, I don't need 200 penny worth of bread. I just need what you have. And in your life, God can do whatever he needs. Whatever God has given you to do, he can do it with what you have. You don't have to be a millionaire. You don't have to have the nicest house. You don't have to have the nicest car. You don't have to have what the world tells you, you, you that maybe you think that you need or maybe somebody says, well, you can't serve God. You don't, you're not this kind or you don't have this or that. No, you just serve God with what you have. Our church, we can go forward. We have to serve God with what we have. We take inventory of what we have and we take care of it well and God will provide the rest. We may only have five loaves and two fishes for 5,000. God will provide. And now that doesn't mean for the Easter egg hunt, you only come with five eggs and just throw them out there and say, there's eggs out there, kids. No, it's not talking about that, amen. But this is talking about in our church, in our life, there, may, there are things that we have no control of. And all we have is five loaves and two fishes. But we give it to God. And we use that to the glory of God, and God will make it work. God is about multiplication, amen? God will multiply. God just needs you to give what you have. God has given you everything you need. You just have to focus on that. Don't focus on what, maybe what you don't have. Don't focus on what God should give us. Don't focus on what you think you have to have to solve the problem. God has already solved it. Amen. Too many times we focus on how we think the problem should be solved. God says, just focus on what I've given to you. And it's natural. It's natural to do that. I, you know, I'm not saying that the disciples uh, were wrong because they were just human like we all are. When we look at something, we begin to try to what? Solve the problem. I've done it. But what I'm telling you is, after you've done everything you can do and you come to a point where you don't know what else to do, that's where faith comes in. You say, God, this is all I have. And then you trust God 
for the rest. It's not wrong to try to solve the problem. But don't let that become the focal point. Because if you focus on solving it and lose sight of faith, then what happens is you'll, never, you'll always come short. Because 200 penny worth of bread still wasn't enough. But that's all that they had. But Jesus wants everybody to eat. Jesus wants everybody to be filled. If we constantly focus only on what we can do, then we'll fall short. If you focus only on what you have, you'll always fall short. But that's where faith kicks in. You do everything that you can, and then you look to Jesus. Say, God, the rest is up to you. And Jesus will take that faith and multiply it. Five loaves and two fishes, yes, was not enough. That's true. But it's enough in the hands of God. What you have, yes, it's not enough. That's the reality. Yes, you don't have enough to pay the bills. Yes, I understand. It's not enough. Yes, I understand. There's not going to be enough food. But you trust God and God will multiply it. Matthew 6, 33. And maybe that was the Lord's will. We turn there at first. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. God will provide all. I love how in verse 42 it says, And they did all eat. Everybody. God took care of every single person. And then also look, and were filled. You know why? Because men like to eat. Amen. One piece of toast and a little slab of fish is not going to cut it for me. <laughs> Amen. It does for my wife, but buddy, I mean, you got to give me a couple pieces of toast, and I want to honk a slab of fish, because fish is not very filling. I mean, you got to have like three or four pieces of tilapia before you're even like making a sound in the bucket, you know. I mean, it's just not very filling. But God took care of everybody. Everybody got to eat. Everybody had food, and they were filled. In your life, God doesn't want to just take care of you. God wants to do above and beyond. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 is a good verse. Let me go there and read it to you. Ephesians chapter 3. It's a good verse to memorize. I say that, I don't have it memorized. <laughs> I have part of it memorized. I'm working on it. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Unto Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all, age, throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. I love how it says, unto Him that's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. God will do above and beyond. Amen. Uh, everybody's familiar with Psalms 23, how that uh, Jesus said, I'll, I'll fill your cup, and it's, and he, or He says, and my cup runneth over. Amen. God wants your cup to run over. God wants to fill you more than what you need. Amen. God wants to take care of you. Amen. And in our lives, we have to focus on what we have and then watch God take care of the rest and even more. Amen. They didn't have enough to get it done. Yes. I understand our church doesn't have enough to get it done, maybe at this time. But God will provide. And God will provide even more. Amen? And then last, number three, focus on His power, not yours. You have to focus and change, your, change how you look at it that it's not your power to get it done. When God gives you a command, He's not telling you to do it on your own. Amen? Jesus is with you. The Holy Spirit indwells you on the inside. When God tells you to do something, God will empower you to get it done. You have to focus on His power, not yours. Everyone had plenty, and they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments and of the fishes. Well, that's a lot of food from five loaves and two fishes. But that's because God has the power to multiply. God has the power to go above and beyond. We just have to focus on that when the problems come. 
Focus on the fact that God can take care of the church. Focus on how God can take care of your home and your family. On His power. They forgot what Jesus had already done. Focus on that. And God will take care of it. God can grow the church. God can meet our needs. God can go above and beyond. We have to focus as a church on God's power. And we have to rely on God's power. A lot of times we know that God can do it, but we forget to rely on God. We forget to yield ourselves to God. We forget to ask God to fill us and to use us. We've got to not only just realize God has the power, but we've got to seek God's power to get it done. We have to get on our knees and beg God and ask God for the power because His power can do it. He can take care of it. He can reach people. But we've got to have His power to do it. God has the power. God will provide. God has the answers, but we must look to Him. Amen. If we focus on our own power to get the work of God done, we'll fall short. We may not, will not get it done. But we have to together get in the Word of God and get in prayer and ask God for His power and rely on God. Put faith in God's power to get it done. Jesus or God says in Malachi, prove me. We have to prove God. Amen. Put God to the test. Amen. Focus on God's power to get it done. Jesus says, I have all power in heaven and in earth. That power is talking about authority. Jesus has the authority. Amen. Jesus has been given the authority. Amen. He's God, but God the Father, as He said, gives Him the authority for the local church. That's the difference between our church and others in this town. Every other denomination, every other so-called assembly of churches does not have the authority given to them. That's why it's important in the, lo in the local church to be baptized by a Baptist church of like faith because those other churches are not given the authority by Jesus. We have been given the authority. We have been given the power to do the work of God. Amen. That's why we don't accept another baptism. That's why we don't accept other denominations because they don't believe as we do and they don't have the authority that we do. Amen. Jesus has the authority. Jesus has the power and He gave it to the local New Testament Baptist church. Amen. But we have to focus on that authority. Focus on God's power to get it done. Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. doesn't matter what the devil does, what the devil tries. We can be encouraged to know no matter what comes, no matter what difficulty, no matter what opposition, no matter what the government does, even though it's crazy. Amen. But no matter what comes our way, we've been given the authority of God. God has, will give us His power to get it done. Amen. We have to trust Him for it. How's your focus this morning? Uh, my brother, I'm the only one in my family, well, besides Trevor, I forgot. Trevor's getting close. But I'm the only one in my family without glasses. Besides, you know, like I said, Trevor, but he's getting close. He's, I don't know what he thinks. Sometimes I wonder if he, you know, like when he's driving, you know, you ever notice you're like, okay, do you see the line? You know, you don't drive in the middle of it. But I think it's because he's a teenager too. But I don't let him drive my truck. <laughs> so you can drive mom's van, not my truck. Uh, but I remember when Mitchell, he, uh, he used to have pretty good vision. And he finally had to humble himself and realize his eyes were going bad. You know, kind of had to, you know, finally realize that. He did not want glasses. That, I mean, he was stubborn when he had to finally, he, and he did kind of look goofy with glasses for a little while there. I mean, we got used to it, but I was like, yeah, you know, I was honest with him. I was like, yeah, it looks a little different, you know, but it's because I wasn't used to, you know, Mitch with glasses. Now he wears contacts. He's all excited, you know, the whole contact thing, poking your eyes and stuff. I can't touch my eyeballs. I don't want to touch my eyeballs. Y'all are crazy that wear contacts. I'll wear glasses when it comes down to it. And, uh, Make fun of me all you want, amen, but I, I can't stick stuff in my eye, you know, this, this whole, ugh, crazy. I remember when Mitchell, you know, he first went and uh, realized his eyes were going bad. He, his focus was beginning to deteriorate. His, his eyes couldn't focus, just couldn't get right. So he had to 
get glasses. And it was a humbling experience for him because he had to realize that he had to now depend on glasses. And I thought about that in a Christian's life. When we have to change our focus, we have to humble ourselves because to take the focus off of you and put it on God means you have to take away your pride and realize you can't. That's tough for Christians. That's tough for people because that's what salvation is. You have to take pride and realize that only Jesus can take you to heaven. You can't work your way to heaven. But we have to do that as a church. We have to realize, we have to take away our pride and realize we can't do it. Jesus said, without me, ye can do nothing in John chapter 14. We have to humble ourselves and take the focus off of us and become dependent on God. We have to put on our spiritual glasses, so to speak, and begin to, help, uh, and begin to focus through the eyes of Jesus. Amen. How's your focus this morning? Are you looking to yourself or are you looking to Jesus? Focus on God. Focus on obedience. Amen. All Jesus asks is that we obey. Amen. He's given us the promised land. He's given to us Canaan. He's given us the authority, the power to get it done. But we have to just focus on obedience. Don't question God. Don't be like the children of Israel that said, Can God? Amen. Don't do that. Don't limit God. Amen. Like I said, God is not limited by your circumstances. He's only limited by your faith. Don't limit God. Give God the opportunity. Give God a chance to do it. Amen. And obey. Focus on His power. Amen. How's your focus this morning? As a church, we can grow. We can do it. But we have to focus on Christ. Focus on Him. And the more you focus on Jesus... You'll be surprised the more that Jesus will change, change you. Amen. You'll be focusing on Jesus and you'll say, Wow, I don't need to worry about that. I need to worry about myself. And Jesus will change you. And then you watch as God begins to grow. Amen. God wants to work on us. Amen. Focus on God. Focus on Christ. Amen. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you.